Hey everybody, it's Robbie Battle, and this is uh, a lot of you guys may have been waiting on this. It's uh, time for the debate that I've advertised here. Both gentlemen here have advertised on their channel. It's uh, Brenda Law and Michael Polston. Uh, it's going to be a debate on theism um, as opposed to atheism. And we're going to start off with opening statements. And I'm going to let Brendan, Brenda Law go first here. So, Brenda Law, I'll yield the mic to you here. All right. Appreciate it, Robbie. Well, um, I guess as far as opening statements go, I guess we can start it out like this. Uh, today, I'll be arguing against the existence of God, uh, like so many logical and rational minds have already done. Now, uh, take, for example, Epicurus, an ancient Greek philosopher, for example, who said, quote, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then is he not, he, then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? End quote. Or some of our country's founding fathers, like Thomas Jefferson, who said, quote, Ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. Ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them. And no man has ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is a mere abracadabra of the Montebanks calling themselves priests of Jesus, end quote. Or uh, maybe you like Benjamin Franklin, who um, who says, quote, lighthouses are more useful than churches, end quote. But uh, even beyond history's great thinkers and their philosophies, there lies a lot more to my argument. Take, for example, the uselessness of prayer in a world that supposedly cannot deviate from God's will and plan. Uh, morality that clearly shouldn't come from any holy books and rather exists from society's own benefit. Uh, the paradox of omnipotence and omniscience that... Uh, quite frankly, logically destroy the concept of God. Uh, the vast amount of biblical errors and inconsistencies that outright contradict itself. Uh, scientific evidence that debunks account from within the uh, from within the Bible. Uh, simple fact, in my own opinion, that I'm I'm going to be arguing myself that uh, Christians today do not practice what their holy uh, scriptures teach, which does create a lot of doubt if they even truly believe. Um, even the entire life of Jesus Christ that was outright plagiarized from stories about a bird-headed Egyptian uh, sky god, uh, Horus, that was written 3,000 years before Christ or anything was ever written about him. So by the end of this debate and after hearing these arguments expounded, you know, I feel as if any logical or rational mind will come to the conclusion that there is not, nor has there ever been a god, and I do deeply anticipate any evidence uh, to the contrary. All righty. Um, so I guess, Michael Paulson, are you ready to do your opening statements? Or? Yeah, just just uh, give me one second, man. Um, right. I'm still getting some of my stuff together real quick. All right. Any? Okay, um, I will be arguing. Can you hear me? Okay, making sure my mic was on. I will be arguing on uh, the other half of uh, of this paradigm, and we can see basically the culmination of atheism. Um, I do have rebuttals for his arguments. I have uh, read his statement there by Epicurus many times, and there are uh, reasons why we have pain and suffering in this world. And even the, the astute most atheists agree that there are a reason why these are here. You know what I'm saying? Stoicism, all this stuff. They've even countered their own arguments in their own message. They've already given themselves the answers as saying that some of the bad stuff in humanity has done just as much to, to further along humanity than it has to do the opposite. You understand what I'm saying? It's it's all this evolutionary progress. And, you know, you can look at, um, you know, famous quotes by other atheists that I'm sure that Brand the Law would, would probably know who they are, like Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell said in his quote, in one of his quotes, uh, Christianity, as soon as it conquered the state, put an end to the gladiatorial shows, not because they were cruel, but because they were adulterous, 
The result, however, was to diminish the widespread education of, in cruelty by the populace of the Roman towns were degraded. Christianity also did um, much to soften the lot of slaves. It established charity on large scales and inaugurated hospitals, although the great majority of Christianity failed lamentably in their practices that you're talking about um, in charity. The ideal remained the same, remained alive, and ever inspired some notable saints. In a new form, it passed over uh, to moderate liberalism and remains the inspiration of much that is hopeful and somber in the world. Now, you can look at a place like liberal Missouri. Liberal Missouri was a town founded by a colonel after the Civil War, who was an atheist named George H. Walter. And upon visiting liberal Missouri, a writer, a debater for uh, Christian philosophy, went to liberal Missouri and found out that a lot of the town had just really degraded itself. Uh, there was prostitution. He said that there was irreverence from the kids to the adults. and. It wasn't that the fact that it was a failed experiment, the, the experiment was successful. It was a fact that, you know, the, the town wasn't flawed based on the idea or on the experiment. It was terminally flawed based on the foundation of atheism. Um, you know, like I said, even Bertrand Russell said that, you know, does he believe in God? No, he switches from agnostic to atheist quite a bit. But what... Bertrand Russell even had to agree with from a Christianity standpoint was that, you know, Christianity has done a lot for the world and it really does get neglected, especially with this humanism that they teach in school and whatnot. And with the atheist, I think that Christianity is probably one of the most attacked religions there is. Um, and, and we're just, mind you that Christians are, it's biblical faith. It's biblical faith, which is different than what you read in Webster's Dictionary that faith is. There is reasons why people do believe in the scriptures. I mean, the religion has been around 2,000 years. Actually, technically, if you want to go back to the Old Testament, it's been around a lot longer. But nothing's going to survive 2,000 years unless there's some truth into it. And you have so many prophecies. Uh, you can go through the science. Um, the uh, aforementioned sciences that are in the Bible, you can go through the archaeology, you can go through all this, all this stuff, and if you look it back, you'll see how accurate the Bible is at placing this stuff. Um, a lot of people want to discredit it based on the secular movement. I, uh, I can, I cannot agree further with any of the secular arguments. Like I said, I've already looked into uh, Brian the Laws, Epidurus. Um, Epicurus statement. Like I said, I actually have it pulled up. It was one of the arguments that I was going to go over. But I'll go ahead and, and let Brand go in further and, and let him do his present his case. All righty. So, Brandon Wall, yield the mic to Brandon Wall. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think, uh, I think Michael's done a good job so far of uh, essentially. Uh, just trying to slander some people that just so happen to be atheists, which, hey, that's fine, um, but it doesn't do much in the way of proof. Um, I, I, I did notice a lot of things that I considered false in your opening statements, but um, since we do want to move on with this, I guess I'll start with my actual uh, first in-depth argument here, which is uh, the concept of prayer in itself. Um, now, Prayer is defined as a solemn request for help or an expression of thanks um, addressed to a God or an object of worship. Now, in a Christian's case, they would pray to God. Now, prayer is not only encouraged, but it's actually commanded by God as seen in Matthew 26, 41, Mark 33, 13, Luke 18, 1, Ephesians 6, 18, and Romans 12, 12. Um, the interesting, very interesting here, considering God also speaks of... Um, I guess you call it a predetermined plan via his own will. Uh, you can see that in Jeremiah 29, 11, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, among others. Now, the question is, why would an infallible God whose will shall be done regardless 
um, of, of anything else, mandate that you, through prayer, ask him to change his plan. Now, for him to actually change his plan based on your wishes would, would indeed prove that he is not infallible. So this cannot happen. Um, another way to look at this, and it, it's really illogical, but another instance to look at this is, um, let's put it into these perspectives. Um, if your prayer is in coherence with uh, God's existing plan, then what you've just done is redundant. If your prayer is against that plan, then your prayer is, is pretty much futile. Um, even when expressing gratitude for things that happened or didn't happen in your life, you're still insinuating that God granted you this pleasantry when there is absolutely no proof of his existence or even that he would have it intentionally aided you. And on the opposing side of the coin, uh, so to speak, why is it then acceptable to write off any negative instances in your life as a part of God's plan when he supposedly loves you or even to pass the buck on to evil, evil that God is also responsible for creating, according to uh, Isaiah 45, 7. Um, so, yeah, th there's just a, a few of the questions I have as it relates to the concept of prayer. And uh, I'll yield the mic now. Um, I got some notes written down, and you remember I gave you some Bible verses that uh, that I wanted you to read, right? Now, let me see. Which ones did I give you? Um, did you want to go ahead and start off with uh, the one on, um, let's see, shit. The one in Genesis that I gave you, man? About the covenant? Are you there? Yeah, shoot. No, I'm Robbie. Hey, Robbie. <laughs> well, anyways, I'll just go through it. I'll wrap it up if you can look it up. I think it's Genesis 17, verse, um, verse 1, I believe. But if you go through there and you look up the covenant with Abraham, God says that every male child shall be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, this is what you call scientific foreknowledge. How could they know 3,000 years ago? You know, why would they choose day eight? Did you ever stop to wonder that? Why not day seven? Why not day 10? Did you ever stop to wonder about that, Bran? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm kind of in the business of... Um what is more logical and, and to okay be honest but with did you, you ever kind of did you ever kind of wonder why he would you know why out of all this that he would choose day eight well i, I can't wait to hear your explanation okay in the medical field right there's three things that you need to to make sure that you can do a, a surgery to cause clotting and whatnot one is vitamin k uh, what else is the other ones that I have written down? But um, but the overall lying message is that you need to have prothrombin, prothrombin, prothrombin. I have a bad time pronouncing this word, but you need prothrombin. Um, if you look, whenever you're doing surgeries on a baby, right? Whenever the baby's born, it has 90% of the prothrombin needed to do surgery. Now. You go from day two to day five, and that that drops down precipitously, down to 30%. If you were going to do surgery on a baby, the best day would be the eighth day because its prothrombin level goes up to 110%. So that would be the perfect day to do surgery on a baby because that's 20% that's higher than the day it was born and 10% higher than any other time than it would be in for the rest of its life. It's the scientific foreknowledge. See, because now you know that, and now you understand that, but this was written way before this was even known before we even had a prothrombin. And there's many more verses in the Bible like this. Um, 
going on into uh into your response of uh you know your your response that you had your opening in your opening statement i'll go ahead and go through um go through another uh well-known atheist here and and use them because to me it's slander whenever you're using their works um you know this right here these have uh, been recorded so i mean i'm using i'm using their arguments you know that right it's not that i'm just making them up you're also not cherry picking either are you yeah and, and neither do you right whenever you call out the bible i mean you cherry pick and you have selected stuff that you believe in too so i mean it's 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 no different but i'm just giving you stuff that basically um quotes and stuff like that just as responses as as you do as well so we'll go ahead and go with a guy named frederick nietzsche uh which i know you know who frederick nietzsche is we believe that severity violence slavery dangers in the street and in the heart secrecy stoicism tempters art <clears throat> and devilry of every kind that everything wicked terrible tyrannical and predatory and serpentine in man serves as well for the elevation of the human species as it is the opposite now here's my thing right is that yeah you could sit there and say that god's cruel and he's unjust and um you know if he is unjust and if he is cruel he's he's malevolent uh malevolent 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 <laughs> or you could sit there and say well Who's best determined to make these decisions? Would it be you or would it be me personally? I don't think so. If it's gonna work to benefit the human race, then why wouldn't you just say that a God, a malevolent creator that you'd like to call, he would be in the best position to determine what's best for humanity? That would be- that, that that would be if he existed and um with no evidence literally zero evidence of the existence of god then it becomes in the in the hands of man uh man who run the church uh that's the problem if if there were any evidence for a real god then yeah of course it would at that point seem to be that this is the case this is the deal this is the uh the plan you got to roll with however there's no proof of him so we see the power of gods fall into the hands of man and we've seen where that can end up uh you know i'm not going to go your route and start naming off uh religious figures who have uh had their down and outs and just to go ahead and clarify any um confusion Here's the difference between an atheist and a believer. As an atheist, when I bring up quotes and, and, and stories from the Bible, I'm doing so because these are your holy scriptures. I'm doing so because this is the book that you hold up as the inerrant word of God, of a perfect God. So when there are examples within those texts of several um, behaviors that are very much not acceptable then it means a tad bit more when a believer says an atheist said this I'm gonna tell you the difference right here an atheist did this or an atheist did that here's the difference as an atheist I don't look at another uh, well-known well-respected atheist as my God I look at him as another flesh and blood human being. Um, your book that I'm taking these quotes from claim you, you claim this is how you're supposed to live your life. That this this is the word of an infallible God. That's the difference between quoting an atheist, uh, just some guy, and you quoting this book you claim to be a holy scripture. Um, and with that said, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, a second argument I have and bring this up, bring this on the table. And uh, it's the topic of morality, because I do hear a lot of Christians talk about morality. Um, a lot of YouTube videos I've seen, so I decided that maybe this would be a good argument to put out on the table. Um, 
Now, quite frankly, I've, I've found it quite fascinating that anyone who has actually read the Bible would think that it's a great source for morality. Uh, I give you Numbers 13, 17 through 18. You'll see the verse. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man intimately. But all the girls who have not known man intimately spare for yourselves. Um, also, we have Ephesians 6, 5 it says slaves obey your earthly masters and uh, deep respect and fear serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. So. To save time and, and, and not go through quite this entire list here, uh, there are examples of uh, promotion of murder, rape, pillage, plunder, slavery, and child abuse within these uh, covers here. Um, now, pretty much none of this stuff would pass in today's society, especially America, which is a country tagged as a Christian nation with about, at last count, 70.6% uh, a Christian population. So the question now becomes, if we did not receive our morals from holy books, where did we get our morals? And that's what a lot of people want to ask me. So here's, here's a shortened down version of the explanation behind that kind of the history behind where morality comes from. Now, we humans created our morals beginning with biological sources such as basic survival instinct and behaviors of social species. Um, it kind of continues on into more human philosophy and assessment of harm versus benefit later on. But our morality is just derived from a set of behaviors that allows multiple human beings to cooperate in a society with the goal to maximize benefit and happiness and to minimize harm and misery, which we are already biologically primed to desire, obviously. Um, now, how do we know not to kill people? Well, societies do start to break down fairly quickly if people run around slaughtering each other. And it wouldn't take long to figure out that this is this kind of behavior gets in the way of a society. Thus, we're going to determine it to be bad. Um, okay, to sum up, let's say this. If, if humans wish to survive, we typically need to cooperatively live together. And it's, it's a biological imperative driven by the evolution of the social species and our basic survival instincts to do so we accomplish more as a whole than we do as individuals and without cooperation societies wouldn't be able to specialize into experts like scientists or police officers or farmers and instead you've got everyone mediocre at the same small set of skills just individually trying to survive in order to live together and operate as a group we had to figure out how not to step on each other's toes so morality is the assessment as to what helps to that goal and what detracts from that goal. Um, so in closing, morality most certainly does not come from an old book that gives a pass to travesties. Today's society wouldn't even allow in the first place. And I yield the mic. All right, Paulston, uh, yield the mic to Paulston here. You ready there, Michael, or? Okay, sorry. I know it's a formal debate, but I feel like I should be entertaining or something right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, freaking... La da 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 da. Wish I had my webcam on. I was totally doing jazz hands just now. Y'all missed it. <laughs> oh, this isn't That's the quote that I was gonna go with, but I was gonna go with another quote from another atheist. But let's go ahead and, and, and see what the rules and the human conduct for atheists are. And I, I understand that Brand's going to say that, you know what, I, I don't look at other atheists for, for my moralic views. But where did these really, these moralic views come from? Your morality, where does it come from? See, the thing with, uh, with atheism is that there is no real room, there's no real reason why anybody would uh, develop these, these morality 
the, 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 the common culture that we have today, basically all the common culture that we have today, as I've read from Bertrand Russell, basically has accumulated from Christianity. But we go through a quote from William Provine, and like I said, this, pro, this uh, quote wasn't one that I was going to read, but I'll go ahead and read it anyway. Modern science directly implies that there are no inherent moral or ethical laws, no absolute guiding principles for human society. And this is the problem that we get down to today, and you can look at society today. You know, the further that we get away from Christianity, you see the breakdown of society. Now, I know that Brand will come up with some sort of philosophy, some preconceived notion that, you know, perhaps it is uh, the youth today, or perhaps it's the oppressive government today. And, and, you know, maybe to a degree, he would have be a little bit right. But we see what's going on in the places like North Carolina, and you see what's going on in your schools. Um, atheist, the atheist teaching and atheistic philosophy, there is no guidance there for morality. It says, if I'm bigger than you, and I'm stronger than you, and I can take what's yours, then I should be able to do it at the end of the day. That's basically what, you know, and most of the principles for evolution, I mean, it's funny, the atheists will always cling to eth evolution and make it seem like it's, you know, actual fact. Whenever most of the studies, like say the English pepper moss study or Hankel's theory of recapitulation, whenever you go back and look at those, they've been discredited for hundreds of years. Just like, um, and I still hear this argument today and it drives me up the wall, just like spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was, discredited by Louis Pasteur 150 years ago. But it's funny how they'll always cling to this. There's no proof of any God, but there's damn sure no proof of a biogenesis. There's damn sure no proof of spontaneous generation. And as I've mentioned before, now, Robbie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm still here. <clears throat> um. The numbers, can you go ahead and give me the numbers? Um, the, oh, the numbers that I gave you the, the, yeah, and I want you to read those off to me. Okay. Um. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you would just want to do the ones that you have in numbers? Yeah, just go ahead and read those <laughs> off real quick. Okay. All right. Should be easy enough. We're all in 19. So I'll start off here. I'll do it in order. I don't know if it matters, but numbers 19. Green, I'd, uh, here I had my Bible. I'll just read it instead of having to open up a tab. So I'll start off. Uh, he's going to use numbers 19.2. Is the first one I have here it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law. Uh, the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Uh, dang, it's my phone. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Where's my phone? Oh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Don't call on to. Sorry. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Do you have it written down on your end? Or do you? Because I got to call yeah, back. Yeah, do you want to just go ahead and finish this up? Um, let me know how, how, how long it's going to take, man. Yeah, because I'm going to have to call them back. It's probably doing my trip. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you can go and answer it, man. Go ahead and answer it. I'll go through uh, what I have. Sorry. Well, anyways, right, basically what this, what the, what that message was, was the water of purification. For if you touched a dead body, you had to go through the water of purification. Now, you take the fact that they had the ashes of a red heifer. And you pour that you pour that water into those ashes, right? That's how they make lace soap. I don't know if you know this or not, but 
Yeah, that's how they make clay soap. Um, what else was it that they had in there, cedar wood? So that would just be a perfect way to make clay soap. Whenever you put those ashes in there, and that's how the settlers used to make their soap back in the days. Now, like I said, this was, you know, in Leviticus, so we know it's thousands and thousands of years old. This is that that uh, um, science foreknowledge that's in the Bible. You know, how would they know about, you know, touching a dead body? You know, there was um, a doctor back in 1847. He worked in a clinic in Vienna. Now, he was from Budapest, Hungary. He traveled to Vienna. And basically, what was happening about that time, and what they called it was labor fever, was about one in every six women at this hospital died. And they couldn't figure out why. But they all died of the same symptoms. They just, there yet again, and these are science people, you know, these are people who work in the medical field. And even then, even though you're sitting there saying that all these people that are atheists, they still have their superstitions as well. So don't just think that it's just Christianity. So they, they claim it as labor fever, and they're, you know, sometimes the death rate for, for wives that were going into labor would go up. Um, there would be 18% during the winter, and it would go up to 50% during the summer, and they had no answer for this. Now, um, this doctor, you know, couldn't take it anymore. You know, basically, he went on a sabbatical. He said, uh, you know, I'm just going to try and work it out because he just couldn't take all these deaths until one of his friends, you know, a surgeon got a small cut is about an inch. You know, it wasn't anything major, but he ended up dying of the same symptoms. What he soon found out. What he soon found out was that um, they were touching dead bodies. They were doing the autopsies and they wasn't washing their hands pretty much. Or they were washing their hands, but they were washing their hands in one bowl of water, wiping their hands off on the same towel. Um, if they would have read what Robbie was talking about in numbers, the, the water purification, they would know that a dead body is unclean and that you could spread germs. So you take that red heifer and you put it in a vial and then you let that water go through it and you form soap. What else was mentioned in there, Robbie? Was it hyssop, which is a common product and a lot of your mouthwashes. See, this is foreknowledge. Yeah in the Bible that was in the Bible. So you may not be able to see God, but being a Christian is believing that the Bible is God's word. Now you, you can go through the Old Testament and you can find excerpts, some of it not so accurate because it just depends on, on basically which version of the Bible you're reading. The King James Version is the most accurate version of the Bible. Is it hard to is it hard to decipher? Yeah, it's hard to decipher. A lot of the stuff that's mentioned in the Bible, you may not get, like shaving the sides of your beards. You shouldn't. Most of the time, most people believe that was for God to, you know, establish that the Israelites from the Egyptians and other cultures and whatnot. But there is science foreknowledge that that you can use to sit there and say, well, huh. How did they know this? This is kind of advanced for that ancient society because you can go back and look and, and the Egyptians were world renowned for their medicine treatments. Um, there yet again, you can look uh, at other scriptures where it says, for the life of the uh, flesh is in the blood and I have given you it upon you the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is in the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. So basically, in Leviticus 11 through 14, you can read it, where they're saying that that basically your life essence is in your blood. That yeah, it has a big thing to do with your life. But yet, you go back to scripture, or you go back to the time in history where what did George Washington go out? He catches a cold, and they bleed him to death. So, I mean, it's it's not so far fetched considering the fact, I mean, it's, it has a pretty stable core in it. So, I mean, you can sit there and say that, oh, well, uh, 
I have to jet, guys. Mom is going to fill in for me. All right. Hey, oh, Robbie, when are you getting back from your trip? Do mm. you know? Well, it's probably just going to be a one. I got to get to them in Leeds, which is a little further than what I'm supposed to go. So I probably – I'm supposed to be there at 22.15. I would say I'll probably be home late tonight, like 12, probably. 12 o'clock? Do you just want to go ahead and do it then? Well, I mean, we can, but we kind of – I mean, it's up to you, man. We've kind of started it, but I don't know what brands <laughs> schedule it's like. But I uh, – um, uh, I actually, um, I'm good right now. I wouldn't be able to do anything after 1230, really, yeah. though, unless we were going to do it super late. And I mean, I, I, I could have, that. I can, if it's okay, it's really up to you guys. I mean, I could have mom just unmute it and do what I've been doing, basically, but because I can keep it open. If you guys want to do it that way, it's, it doesn't I, matter to me. I just got to go because they change it. I guess as long as the room's open, I mean, I'll, I'll go. Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead. Okay I'll yield the mic then. Sorry, I'll keep it open. Mom's going to just un unmute it and tell you the next person to go on or whatnot. Is that right? Oh. All right. Go ahead, Brandon. Sorry. All right. Um. Okay. Well, I noticed. I noticed Michael had a lot of the a lot of the same old atheist quotes, and I, I you know, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but difference being, you quote another atheist. You just quoted to me something another flesh and blood human being just like me said. A human being who is completely capable of faults, who could be a complete asshole. I don't know. I don't even know the person. But I do know that they're just a person. I quote to you biblical verses. You hold this book up as the word of a infallible God. That's kind of the difference. Um Pretty much a big difference, if you ask me. But I'll I'll digress as that. Um, you I noticed that you asked me where our morals come from, which that's interesting because I just did a five minute presentation on that. So I don't know if maybe you took a nap or something, but um, I'll hook you up with my notes later. I don't I want to bore everyone and, and go back over that again. Um, you, you you made mention of evolution and um, morality as it relates to evolution, where a lot of what you said is true about evolution in, in, in your beginnings of the species. Um, however, eventually evolution led to societies, and our morals are pretty much there to uphold society, so win-win. Um, you said there's no proof of spontaneous generation. Um, that's interesting, because it's, I, I went and looked it up just to make sure and it says just what I thought, the supposed production of living organisms from non-living matter. So essentially, you just made the argument that nothing, something cannot come from nothing, which is pretty interesting, um, considering there's really no explanation for your God. Where did he come from? He's just always been there. So something came from nothing, even in that, um, even in that way, per se. Um, I also noticed here you said that, uh, you know, you know, a lot of athe atheists have their superstitions, which I'm sure that's the case. And on the other side of that coin, you have closet atheists who pretend to be Christians and Muslims and, and for several other um, ad religious adherences and, and for random reasons, uh, e even at some cases to save their own lives. Uh, but here's something else I'd like to throw out onto the table since we are... Uh, you know, tossing around ideas here. This is the paradox of omnipotence and omniscience. So let's start off with the paradox of omnipotence. Um, and for, for those over there who don't know, omnipotence is basically the ability to do all things, have all abilities. Okay. That supposedly is omnipotent. But let's break down omnipotence. Some abilities are contradictory to each other and some actually would negate each other. Okay, so let's think of an example here. Um, God has the ability to live forever, eternal life. But that also means that he cannot die and that he does not have the ability to kill himself. So it seems only rational that God cannot, in fact, do everything. 
And then you have the paradox of omniscience and omniscience basically means to know all things. So if God knows everything, then he cannot forget because the moment he forgets, he doesn't know everything. But if God can't forget, then he doesn't know how to remember or recollect. And if he can't recollect, uh, then there's something he doesn't know. He doesn't know how it feels to recollect or remember something. So once more, it seems only rational that God cannot, in fact, know everything. So just a simple little dissection using a tad bit of logic brings up a lot of questions as it relates to the paradox of omniscience and omnipotence. And with that, I'll yield the mic back to you. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Uh, well, most of that is just talking in circles. Um, the thing that really distinguishes God is that God is supernatural. Nothing in nature can come out of nothingness. You're 100% you're right. But God is outside of nature in the biblical perspective. So I want to go ahead and read this quote. Um, this guy is George Wald. He's a professor of biology and he is a Nobel Prize winner. So I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, I can use these quotes because there yet again, I am just going against the, the, the written logical because as far as I know, nobody's published any of Brand the Law's works. So when, whenever I use these statements by other atheists, I'm using them as basically a, a, a proof of like maybe some sort of logical fallacy there. So we go on to George Walt's statement. There are only two possibilities as how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation that life arose from non-living matter was scientifically disproven 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with the only possi possible conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in a God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. Now, that is from, like I said, a Nobel winning uh, biology. You know, he, he had won the Nobel Prize for biology. He even admits that spontaneous generation and that life arising from non-living matter is an impossibility without the help of a supernatural creator. Now, you, you went through the Bible and you did name some... Um, says where you know you kill the children and and a lot of this stuff is from the old testament now mind you one thing that i do want to come across is whenever you're talking about the old testament you're talking about the laws that was given to society before christ came henceforth the word being a christian now we learn from the old testament but some of the laws that we did back in the old testament they've kind of changed a little bit with the coming of Christ. But we look at what you're saying about the murder, the death, and, you know, the killing of innocent kids, innocent blood. I hear this a lot from atheists, even though, like I said, I read articles from Frederick Nietzsche. A lot of these people just, there's other reasons why, and this may not be you, Brand, so I'm not pointing it, so don't take it personal whenever I say this. But a lot of these atheists, that jumped on board with Darwin, and this goes back from the conception of atheism, not just today, but a lot of atheists just jumped on board for, for reasons of Im immorality. So you look at the fact that did they kill kids? Now, albeit a lot of atheists support what, the, um, you know, their pro-choice abortion that, that goes on today. Um, we kill 50, what, 50,000 of our citizens a year. So you look at that right there. The difference between you sitting there saying that, oh, well, they killed all these kids 
in the Bible and the difference between me sitting there saying, oh, you're aborting all these kids today is that I understand that there's an internal soul. So whenever they say kill all these kids in the Bible, that means that God's going to take them home, that they're going to get a place in heaven. That's coming from my perspective. Whenever you say it's okay for abortion and whatnot, you're taking everything away from that child, everything that he could have in life. You're taking it away. So that's really at the very end difference. Because as a Christian, I feel that God knows more than me. And as an atheist, you feel that you know more than God. And I'll drop the mic and yield it back to you. Okay. Um, well, here's the thing. Uh, that last statement uh, damn near left me in stitches, and I got to really quickly explain to you why. Um, I do not feel as if I know more than this God, and I'll tell you why, because, because God is described as like we just went over omniscient and omnipotent, which I am neither of, but there is also no evidence that he exists or that he is those things so that's that's kind of odd of you to say to kind of to throw out there that i think i know more than something a, a character or a creature that i don't even really believe in that makes no sense um i did catch something at the beginning about a logical fallacy whenever it sure go fill me in on what that was because i i've yet to uh i've yet to see it um now, with that said, I guess I'll move on to my fourth argument, which are biblical contradictions. Um, so, yeah, it's it's no secret to anybody who's actually read the Bible that there are more than a few contradictions within its pages. So, um, you know, to get straight to the point, let's identify some of these glaring inconsistencies. Uh, for example, in Genesis 1, 24 through 27, it states that animals were created before man was created. However, in Genesis 2, 7 and 19... It says that man was created before animals were created. Also in Genesis uh, 2.17, it reads, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thereof thou sure, shalt surely die. So we are to believe that Adam will die the day he eats this fruit. But later on in Genesis 5.5, 5, it reads, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And we know the man went on to have kids. We know that that happened after the fall. Notice the line in uh, Genesis 3.16 directed towards Eve, in pain you shall bring forth children. So the man went on after the fall. Um, what about in Genesis 4.4 4 through 5 when God prefers Abel's offering and has no regard for Cain, yet in Second Chronicles 19.7, Acts 10.34 and Romans 2.11, it says God shows no partiality, uh, and he treats all alike. Um, Genesis 10.5, 10.20, 10.31 indicate that there were many languages before the Tower of Babel. But in Genesis 11.1, 1, it states that there was only one language before the Tower of Babel. Uh, Genesis 16.15, uh, 21, 1 through 3, uh, Galatians 4.22. All say Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. But guess what? Hebrews eleven seventeen says Abraham had one son. Um, Exodus twenty one through seventeen tells us that God gave the law directly to Moses without using an intermediary. But once again, in Galatians three nineteen, we're to believe the law was ordained through angels by a mediary, uh, an intermediary. Um, Numbers eleven thirty three indicates that God inflicts sickness while. Uh, Job 2.7, it says Satan inflicts illness. Um, how many died in the plague? Uh, do you destroy your enemies or do you love them? Is it okay to divorce? Um, is God merciful? Who killed Goliath? How long will the earth be in existence? Who was Joseph's father? Did the angel speak to Joseph or Mary? Should good works be seen? Did Jesus come to abolish the law? When did Judas sell Jesus out? There are two or more answers to every single one of those questions in the Bible. And with so many errors, inconsistencies, and outright contradictions, how can anyone take it as the word of a perfect God? And with that, I'll yield it back over to you, Michael. Well, there you go. I mean, there's...
so many of those right there. I, I can't counter all of them. I will go ahead and counter the one right now about Adam dying. Now, did Adam die? Yes, he did. Up until that point, there was no death. You understand what I'm saying? So he said that there of the day that you eat of the fruit, ye will surely die, and he surely died. He didn't say he would surely die immediately. He said he would surely die. Now, you ran through your, your, your contradictions, bravo, kind of quick. So I'm not going to go through and counter every one of them, although there have been answers. And if you were to look up the opposite side of it, you could find out. It's just like basically whenever they call themselves the 12 apostles and whenever they say that the 12 apostles saw Jesus return, well, guess what? There wasn't 12 apostles because who was it? Judas was dead. This is one of those contradictions that you talk about in the Bible. But we look today and we look through symbology. Like right now, and I don't know if you follow college football, but I know that Robbie Battle follows college football. We have the Big 12 Conference. Unfortunately, there's only 10 teams, just like at the time of Jesus' resurrection, there was only 10 apostles. But they used that name because everybody could already identify them as the 12 apostles. If you came through as the 10 apostles, 11 apostles, the eight apostles, the, the four apostles, how many ever was left at that time, considering the fact what, you know, everybody knew them as the 12 apostles. So it was more of a label. And there's answers to every contradiction. Like I said, I didn't catch all of the, the verses that you threw out and all the contradictions because you went through them kind of fast. Um, what I'm talking about, and like I said, there is foreknowledge in the Bible, and there has been prophecies come out of the Bible. Um, you take the prophecy of the fall of Babylon, the whore of Babylon, uh, where basically they said that she would be bought down by the Medes, which the Medes were the Persians pretty much, and that's basically what happened. And they said that she will sleep a perpetual sleep They'll be drunken. And basically what they were doing was they were having a drunken orgy and the Medes, you know, the Euphrates. And it was a it was a massive Babylon was it was seen as impossible to bring down. And basically what it was surrounded by the Euphrates and what the Medes did was they diverted the Euphrates. They snuck in while they were having this drunken orgy and they brought down Babylon. Um, and that was much after, that was long after the prophecy, the city of Tyre that was uh, prophesied to fall. That's in the Bible. So you can look at probably 2,300 prophecies that came true. Um, like I said, I would have to go through each and every one of your contradictions that you've just made. And then I could probably answer them. Like I said, I don't have those answers today, but I can go and look for them. And I'm sure they're there. The thing about atheism is that there would be no way you take the fact and you look at evolution, which is the only other possibility. Let's be real. Um, you can, unless you're going to get into like Scientology and some of that weird, you know, aliens, you know, just zap monkeys and we became uh, humans all of a sudden and go through their philosophies. But we look at atheism and the model saying that oh well uh you're just telling me something that another flesh and blood human being charles uh darwin came up with and whatnot there has to be a foundation somewhere and you know you you have no other choice but to look at evolution if you're going to go the opposite way of a creator whether it be islam Christianity, whichever one of us, because God never said that there was only one God. He said that there's only one God that you should worship. But we go and look at evolution and you take a look at the science and how we're supposedly evolving. And like I've asked many atheists before on the, the, the evolutionary side, we look at worms, right? It's a basic creature, a worm is. But one thing that, that you can do to a worm is you can cut it in half and it'll still survive. You know what I'm saying? In some cases, it'll regenerate and grow and still be okay. Seems like 
something that we would keep if we're evolving that would be something you know being able to survive while you're cut in half would be pretty fucking convenient we take a look to to progressing in this evolutionary chain and how some of the amphibious creatures are asexual why would we somehow evolve to being having to use sex being a sexual creature to reproduce how would that be evolving it, it doesn't make any sense like i said some of the quotes that go on in atheism kind of there yet again answer their own questions in the bible like the quote from frederick nietzsche like the quote from um you know uh many other atheists that that talk about this right here and how we've developed into a society that's why i'm kind of wondering where you get this whole idea of this is how we developed in a society whenever people like nietzsche and you know people like provine say exactly the opposite of what you're saying right now it doesn't seem like with their beliefs that they would develop some sort of morality and that therein lies the problem with uh with uh, atheism and i'll go ahead and yield the mic and then i'll go ahead and make my final statement after you're done all right well if you're if you're making your final statement after this then um yeah i got a little bit more to go here so i guess i'll just go ahead and air it all out um I, I did notice you said I was taking it a little too quick there for you, so I will slow it down a bit as best I can. Um, you, you spoke about prophecies that come true, and this is clearly by interpretation only. And given the content of the Bible, it's pretty easy to make just about anything fit somewhere with its allegorical writings and things of that nature. Um, I also find it interesting that you, you find it um, perplexing why anything would want to go from being asexual to having sex, but I'll leave that alone and leave that where it stands. Um, my argument next is, uh, and, and I'll get into a couple here since you are saying you, you want to do closing uh, statements after this. Um, so I'll try to speed it up, but not too quickly. Uh, biblical, uh, let's see, uh, get myself here. Scientific evidence. Let, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, according to, to what the Bible has told us. We are to believe, for example, that when Noah's Ark rested atop Mount Ararat, two kangaroos jumped off and they hopped 7,726 miles back to Australia. They did this without opposable thumbs, but I guess still somehow managed to pick up every single bone from their dead along their journey so they wouldn't leave any trace of their migration. And not only did they do that, but they did that by using a land bridge that didn't exist. Now, of course, I'm being a little facetious, but it does raise more than just an eyebrow about the flood story, to say the least. Um, now, a Christian will use their Bibles to, to explain to you that the earth is just over 6,000 years old, and we know that for a fact not to be. We know that the earth is 4.54 billion years old. And that dating is based on evidence from radiometric age uh, dating. Um, we've done this to meteorite material, and it's consistent with the radiometric ages of the oldest known terrestrial and lunar samples. Um, the Holy Bible makes several mentions of a flat Earth, but we've known this to be an absolute untruth, even in the days of Aristotle, when he noticed that during lunar eclipses, when the Earth's orbit you know, places it's, it's directly between the sun and the moon, it creates a shadow. Um, and in that process of creating that shadow, we would see that the shadow on the moon's surface was round. So I have to ask, knowing these facts, how can you still feel as if this is a factual book? Um, another thing I, I wanted to bring up, and, I, and I'll, I'll skip a couple of things I have for time's sake here, but uh, I will bring this up, and it's a, it's an argument of plagiarism. So we'll see if anyone out there can guess who I'm describing. Okay. Uh, born of a virgin on December 25th. You may have some ideas already. 
escaped to Egypt, taught in the temple as a child, baptized at 30, had 12 disciples, performed miracles, walked on water, raised the dead, uh, was called the way, the truth, and the light, was crucified, buried in the tomb, and resurrected. Anybody know? It's Horus. Horus, an Egyptian uh, god of the sky who was also said to have the head of a bird. It sounds pretty ridiculous, right? Well, interestingly enough, this story was actually written 3,000 years before the story of Jesus was written. So, I think that also, as I said earlier, does a little bit more than just raise an eyebrow to uh, more stories and accounts from within the Bible. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and yield it to you for your uh, closing statements. Okay, the December 25th reference, Rise from the Dead, all that stuff, not Horus. Now, granted, that's later what it came to be, but all that came from Babylon. Uh, Nimrod's birthday was December the 25th, which basically, if you were to actually study the um, history of Babylon, a lot of, uh, they, they see, Jesus' uh, coming was already basically prophesized before Babylon, before all this stuff, before all that. So basically what they did was they inverted the tells. Now, was Jesus born December the 25th? No, he wasn't. A lot of people guesstimate that he was probably born actually technically whenever close to whenever we celebrate Easter. Um, there yet again, it never said in the Bible, biblically, the exact day that Jesus was born. That's just kind of the way they celebrate it now. And a lot of it is paganism. And I'll give you credit for that one. Most of this, uh, the, the practices today in modern Christianity come from pagan systems which was basically Roman Catholicism. That's, like I said, that, that really has very, very little to do with real Christianity. With that being said, though, um, yeah, the, the stories of Horus, Europa, Saturn, all the pagan gods, um, Mars, all that came from Babylon, which was mentioned and written in the Bible. Nimrod's mentioned as a mighty hunter in the Bible. And this has been studied, actually. So I want to go ahead and leave a closing statement. And this is one of the reasons why I think that, um, you know, and like I said, I'll, I'll go back through some of your arguments and uh, some of the scriptures and stuff that you said um, while you're wrapping it up. But I want to go ahead and take a quote from C.S. Lewis, a man who is going to go be you know, he, he wanted to be an atheist. He wanted to believe that the universe was so cruel and so just. C.S. Lewis wrote, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line cricket unless he has some idea of what a straight line is. What I was comparing the universe to, what was I comparing the universe to whenever I said it was unjust? It just seems that atheism is just too simple. It is just, you can't, you can't get any answers of this. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing more but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument dependent on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that I did not happen to please my private fancy. So there you go. And I mean, you know, some of these atheists, like I said, I use some of their stuff to, to make my case about atheism. Like I said, now, there are several contradictions in the Bible, like Rand said, but are they really, really contradictions? Um, is the Bible really contradicting itself? I think in some cases you get more than one perspective, and that ends up being what you call the problem. Like, for example, if me and Robbie were probably you know, maybe suspects in a crime, 
And we told the exact same story from the exact same standpoint. You would probably think, oh, well, they collaborated together and they got their story together. And basically they're, they're just making this up and you're going to get an officer probably who's going to be suspicious of the story. Now, some of the writers that wrote the Bible, you're seeing it from different perspectives and that ends up being a problem. It's not necessarily a contradiction so much as it is just their perspective. There yet again, you can probably go back. We'll use Judas once again, where in one instance, he he hung himself. And in another instance, his guts pretty much hit the ground. You know what I'm saying in the Bible? Which one is real? It's just from, <clears throat> I think it's from Matthew's perspective, he was hung from Mark's perspective. So you get both perspectives there. It'd be no different than if I were to sit there and say the shooter in Dallas that shot 12 police officers was blown up. Robbie, on the other hand, may say, well, the shooter in Dallas was killed by a big evil robot droid thing. Neither are really necessarily contradicting each other, nor is Robbie's story untrue or mine untrue. Was he blown up? Yes, he was. Was he killed by a, uh, a robot, a drone? Yeah, he was. So there yet again, you know, Robbie may think, oh, wow, man, I think it's neat. Hey, he got blown up by a robot. He just thought that was neat. I didn't see the point of it. So I just said he was blown up. So there's a lot of misinterpretations from the secular side, which is generally where, where Brand usually sees stuff from and like i said had i had a chance to get down some of the arguments i would uh look them up but i'll go back through the video and i'll look them up and i'll i'll do a corresponding video and answer them on my channel later on um but there yet again you can't deny the science for knowledge in the bible you can sit there and make excuses that oh well these these prophecies Oh, well, they're just so open to interpretations. They're just so open interpretations, you know, and I hear a lot about the dragon and the horns. It, whenever a horn is said that it's going to be a king, whenever it says it in one part of the Bible, it means it throughout the Bible. So whenever David says something and refers to the horn, in which a lot of the times there yet again, we can go back to why they consider uh, a horn a king is because Nimrod was the first one he used to wear bull horns so that's where they get that symbolism of a king being a horn so it means that in every part of the Bible I mean there's a lot of I think failed perception from the secular side whenever they make their arguments um like I said I, I would have to slow down your arguments to counter your arguments but there yet again, I, maybe we could have probably put this together a little bit better, could have traded you arguments or something. But there yet again, we both work. So it's kind of hard. And I think that there's just a lot of misrepresentation. Like I said, I've, I've put out science for knowledge out there. Like, how could they have possibly known what would make them pick the eighth day to circumcise their kids or the water of purification or the bloodletting? There's just. The, the Bible has been more advanced in society throughout society. And it's been people's problem of understanding the word for the most part. And me, no less, you know, sometimes the word stumps me too. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to throw out the whole Bible just because I don't understand or don't agree with something particular. Because it will eventually come around to making sense. Because as God said, you know, his will over my will. You know what I'm saying? His knowledge is more than my knowledge. So I'm I'm waiting to catch up. You know what I'm saying? He's already he already knows the answers. If um he gives us in where you're talking about prayer. This this comes in with prayer. God doesn't give you what you ask for. God gives you what you would ask for if you knew what he knew. So, yeah, you're just 
using prayer to keep contact with God. Just like whenever you call your parents, you don't always call your parents asking for something. And sometimes you do call your parents and they might tell you no for whatever you ask for. But you still keep in contact with your parents regardless. And I think to a degree, that's what prayer is. So that's just answering your your thing on prayer. It's not just totally about getting what I'm on. It's to have that communion with God and to have that door open there. And sometimes God tells me no. Sometimes God tells me yes. You know, sometimes he tells me later. But I'm willing to live with that. And that's why I stay a Christian pretty much. And I'll just go ahead and leave it at that and um, leave it off at that. All right. Well, um, I guess I'll quickly uh, rebut to that and give my closing statements. Um, I do believe my horse statements to be uh, factual. So uh, anyone out there, feel free to look them up. Um, oh, I'm not saying that they're not factual. Just wanted to go ahead and interrupt real quick. I'm not saying that they're not factual. I'm just telling you where they came from. Okay. All right. Fair enough. That's not how I took it, but fair enough. Um, I found it interesting that you would knowingly celebrate, uh, the savior's birthday on the wrong day. Um, I would just like to throw out that there are some decent atheists out there since, um, I I've kind of been dissecting the, um, theology of it all. And, um, you know, it's kind of gone a different route, but, uh, yeah, we're not all, we don't all eat babies. Only some of us, um, also, uh, about your whole two perspectives in the Bible thing, I understand that. makes sense. But there are certain contradictions that are completely outright two different um, accounts. So that still does raise an eyebrow, I'd say. Um, also, I don't know why I haven't said anything about it. Maybe because I didn't have it written down. But you have brought up quite a lot about, um, you know, what people... Uh, back in the day would have known about science and, and medicine and things of that nature. And I did just want to bring up that, you know, even if you look at ancient Egyptians who worship completely different gods, look at their medical advances. I mean, um, in pharmacology and surgery, dentistry, they did a lot of things that was way ahead of their time. So I don't think that, you know, your argument is, is this is the sole thing here. I think that you had that a lot back in the, back in those days, as I mentioned earlier, when societies are able to be formed, you can then start getting uh, people who specialize in things instead of everyone trying to just uh, survive being mediocre at a handful of things. Um, and I, I guess I'll stop there and I'll go ahead and I'll, and I'll just uh, go over my closing statements here. Um, I do feel as if tonight I have uh, shown uh, through philosophy uh, even in a small bit, astronomy, biology, history, and morality, uh, and more actually favor atheism to be a much more realistic worldview. Um, the doctrines are just too riddled with contradictions, plagiarism, outright fabrications. Um, there's literally no sufficient evidence for a great flood, a creation account in Genesis, or the existence of a God. Uh, possessing the knowledge we do today, I do actually uh, commend Michael for arguing what I consider to be an unwinnable case. Um, and I do honestly um, appreciate you debating me. Uh, I do appreciate it. Um, and I do want to thank everybody uh, who stopped by and listening. I hope this has been informative and at least somewhat entertaining. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robbie's mom, I guess, who's there now. And, uh, yeah, that's all for me, guys. All right, and I, I want to make a correction right there because I don't celebrate Christmas or Easter. So, because you said that I don't understand why you celebrate, uh, you know, Christmas or Easter pretty much December the 25th. Is, I don't celebrate that. Uh, I see I, that as a pagan holiday, actually. I, I just don't I just don't know many, if any, Christians uh, personally. It may sound anecdotal, but that, that don't celebrate those holidays. So I guess it was more of a general uh, paper statement than uh, just well, strictly directed towards you. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a blanket statement. And like I said, uh, you know, the Sabbath, and I know Robbie knows this, the Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday. And what, you know, once some again, of that's the stuff just... gets a little bit... 
that's that's up to interpretation. There. And like I said, you know, you mentioned the Egyptian uh, Eberus there, and you know the papyrus on it, and some of the stuff there. I I kind of have have residence with, but maybe that could be an argument for another day. I just wanted to go ahead and uh, I I don't agree totally with the Egyptian medicine practices. So, <laughs> well, you know, there, there's there's things that are in the Bible that I don't think you'd quite agree with to this day either. Yeah, um, I know, but like I said, you know, it, for me, with the Bible, I feel like I said, you know, God's knowledge is above mine. And every day, whenever I read it, I understand a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? It's not just like, wow, you have instantaneous knowledge and vast, uh, know everything in the world. You know what I'm saying? There's still going to be questions, even as a, as a as a Christian. But like I said, as a Christian, to me, and this is just my perspective, you can disagree or you can not disagree. Sure. But as a Christian, as a Christian to me, this is what it is. You're living life for fulfillment. You know what I'm saying? You're living to fulfill your life. And to me, as an atheist, and and not you specifically, but looking at some of the writings like Aldous Huxley and other atheists. Uh, it's like they live their life just to survive. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that's just not a really good way to live. No, I um, I agree with you. Um, I live my life uh, to get the absolute most out of it. You, you got to break down the mentality where I feel as if the moment I die, that's it. Whereas, you know, in your case, you feel as if that's when the journey really starts kicking. So for me, I feel as if I have to get the absolute most out of life that I possibly can because once, you know, once I'm dead, that's it. So, no, I, I don't agree with that type of uh, mentality as far as the lifestyle, not at all. I mean, um, you know, and I look at it from a science perspective and I try to look at it because, to be honest with you, I was in the Navy and I probably wouldn't have been two more different than you probably even at your age how old are you about 23 24 29 29 okay so these are ideas that i had from about 22 23 24 whenever i was in the navy i was exactly the same way um and a lot of the stuff in science whenever i studied in great lakes right like energy doesn't work that way you know what i'm saying and this is just from a scientific field, just being, you know, you working mean, in robotics in the Navy. What do you like, mean specific? Like, energy doesn't just go away. It, it, it goes from potential to kinetic energy. But it just doesn't go nowhere. Energy is always going somewhere. You know what I'm saying? It always follows the path of least resistance, but it always goes somewhere. You know what I'm saying? And that's scientific. You could look it up if you want to. So it, it's just kind of hard for me to believe. So what's that the, what's the, what's the problem? I, I just don't well, understand the issue you have with that. I'm just sitting there saying that you know, whenever you said whenever we're gone, we're gone. You know, basically we are energy. Everything we do, we're constant energy. You know what I'm saying? Whether it be potential or kinetic. And the universe is yet ever expanding. Interesting, isn't it? Well, like I said, there yet again. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> but I just wanted to throw that out there. So, uh, do you want to go ahead and close us out, Robbie's mom? <laughs> That's up to you two, or y'all finish arguing y'all's sides. <laughs> well, it's supposed to be a debate, not an argument. Well, debate. I, I think, I think it was pretty both. civil. I, thought we I, think were, I think y'all were very, very polite to each other, and religion is not an easy subject to discuss with anybody. True so enough. I will say, I will say that we all have our own beliefs, and um, I'm not saying that anybody that doesn't believe is wrong, but I can't say anybody that does believe this wrong. I haven't gone to heaven yet. And God knows I hope there is one. <laughs> and it might be a sad thing because I might end up going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But y'all finished? 
Yeah, yeah, we're we're finished. I'll go and put this on here. Mute. <laughs> I'm through. <laughs> Same here. Later, folks. All right. I guess Have that's a good it. One.